for a minute then. Yes. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that, Sophie. Do you carry no on? I, okay. Cool. Um, the application submission includes provisions for a large number of cycle spaces, which meets London plan policy standards. Um, the planning application has not been submitted with a demolition and construction logistics plan. Um, as such, it is recommended that a planning condition is attached to any planning permission to secure details of the measures to be taken to minimise any impacts upon the highway and to ensure disruption to neighbouring properties is also kept to a minimum. Um, in terms of other material considerations, um, the proposed development is, can, is supported um, as detailed within the committee report. Um, finally, um, in relation to consultation, as can be seen from this slide, um, the level of public interest in the scheme has been significant. Um, finally, in terms of the recommendation, this is that the Strategic Development Committee is asked to note the contents of the committee report and the update re report and resolve to, one, agree the reasons for approval as set out in the report and two, grant planning permission based on the conditions listed in Appendix 1 of the report and heads of terms listed in Appendix 2. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, if I could just give you a moment to stop sharing your screen yeah. <laughs> and then we'll move on to um, questions and comments from members. Before I ask members in the room, I did just want to immediately surface one issue which you alluded to in, in your presentation, which is that obviously this application has been with us for a really long time. And some of that seems to be from the timeline you gave because of seeking additional information. And some of that has been about turnover of officers. Um, but I think I'm also right from the papers that we also made an initial error in terms of how the application was validated. Is that right? So the application was originally validated as a minor application um, and it should have been a major application. Um, but all that side of things has been rect rectified um, over the past few months with um, some additional um, assessments being required. So sort of that's namely um, the air quality assessment, um, the energy statement. Um, I guess I just wanted to say sorry to the applicants for any further delay that any errors on our part caused and to assure you that, you know, we're glad to, to this point now. Um, Harley Pontin, can I come to you first? I'll just check from the architect. Maybe it's the book that we've got, but I'm not sure we've got the full plan. You're correct. It's been cut up, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah there's half of... If you can put on the table for to... I most certainly can. I've got all the drawings here. Because then we can, we can check this before we ask... Questions. <laughs> Very helpful. Lose. For um clarity for anyone watching online, although we do have um we do have images in our committee papers, it looks as though those images have been chopped off at the bottom so that we've got each of the floor plans, um, but they're not of the whole building. Do do these images that you've shared here also have the additional images of the front facade? Yes, they do. That's also helpful because I noticed on page 152, we've got an image of the um, design at the front, but it is very small yeah, actually, if, with really hardly any detail. Yeah, there's A3 drawings. There's a base study section that shows the profile, the setback at the top level. Set so, ground floor. So Sally Ponton is just spreading out some of the A3 coloured drawings on the table here. Um, and if they could do so unobtrusively, if any committee members want to get up and have a look at those, um, I would encourage you to do so. Did you want to take a moment to have a look, Mads, while I see if there are other questions? Yes, please. Yep, no problem. In which case, I have a couple of questions for officers. Um, I mean, the first isn't a question. I just wanted to really note the really large amount of community support, um, which takes up a large part of our report and is always really good to see in terms of people's engagement with it and also just a really obvious illustration of the kind of local support and need for the facility as well. There were lots of different Newham addresses here. This is obviously something of the community and by the community. Um, I wanted to ask Sophie about some of the issues that are still unresolved. In particular, on page 126, it looks as if the waste collection arrangements for the residential parts of this scheme haven't been resolved. And there was a suggestion that we might use timed waste collections. Um, I know I've said in this meeting before that obviously Newham is blighted by rubbish and fly tipping and a lot of that comes from historical design decisions and it is just so important for us as a committee that we aren't kind of baking in problems for the future. 
Yeah, um, I think um, the waste officers have suggested that a timed collection may be appropriate. However, we are requiring a condition relating to waste management um, to be attached to any planning permission, which will secure the details of hopefully internal um, waste storage. Um, and I think there's probably um, scope within the floor space um, for this to be done internally. And that's why that condition mm -hmm. is being attached to the permission. Um, for clarity, for anyone watching, the reason that I'm keen on this is again, just so that we're not requiring people to put their rubbish out on the street where it then attracts more rubbish. Um, perhaps I could ask, obviously, we can't resolve this tonight, but do you as the applicant feel confident that that's something you might be able to resolve within the red line of the building? I think, yeah, there is there is scope to do that. I mean, we have a side alleyway which is quite generous. We can indent further into the building a little bit just to extend the refuge that's currently there that we have separated it. I mean, it's it's more than feasible. Okay, that is good to hear. Thank you. Um, Councillor Griffiths. Yeah, yes, Chair. I, 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 like you, was concerned about the tiny drawings on page 152, but having seen the image that the planning officer presented and the new drawings, I find that I'm clear what the uh, street frontage in the rear of the building is going to look like. So I'm happy. Thank you. Councillor Merza, were you next? And then I'll come to you, Madeleine. Yeah, well, is this the time you can speak on the behalf? Of, I mean, not on the behalf, I mean, in favour or against? Um, no, we're considering the application at the moment. So as per your training, if you've got any questions or comments you want to make that are material yeah, to planning, then go ahead. Needed a community place. And I think uh, it took about five years uh, to get to this point where this decision is going to be made maybe tonight. And... Uh, is some much needed community space as well as place for worship. I've seen every Friday people queuing up for a uh, prayer. They pray about three times to accommodate everyone in there. And it's a very good response. It's about 250 people um, um, comes back with the response. And they, they, they approved it in a sense and very few um, and, and disapproved the recommendation. I fully support, and I think we should have a more um, community spaces like this in Birmingham, which, um, you know, um, it's, it's inclusive, the, uh, the gentleman said, it's, it's not just for a Muslim, and it's for all communities. So I welcome that. Thank you. Councillor Sali Bontem. Um, thank you ever so much for bringing us such a beautiful building for us to look at. I myself am an Islamic archaeologist. I've spent many years studying Islamic buildings and places of worship. It looks lovely, particularly within the framework of the modern materials that need to be used. So I think it's going to make a real asset to that little stretch of East Ham, which you've done the best you can at the moment with your smaller mosque, which is a hive of the community. But with this, you're really going to elevate it to a higher level. My concerns and why I wanted to look at the plans was in our book, there was no ablution sinks and there were two toilets, okay? So I wanted to check that you guys had everything you needed to make sure that you could make full use of the worship space and of the community space. Many years ago, I was the, uh, the over-manager of the Hartley Centre before it was taken over and... Um, designed as another group, and I understand the need for community use, for education, for classes, for community coming together in that area. And whilst it is a, one of our central city hubs within the borough, but since the Hartley Centre shut, it has had felt that loss. So thank you for the money that you have collected to give that back to new one. We really appreciate it. So thank you for that. The other thing I wanted to check was that the people living on the top floor, and they look like very nice flats, would have good access to in and out of the building. So the people that will be living in the flats, will they be people living and working, sorry, working within the mosque? Yeah, so if I could just answer your first question. So in terms of access, there's a completely separate access. So it's independent. It can function independently. We've given that flexibility good. so that it's more than just... It, on, it gives you the option that it's ancillary to the main use as key workers or key operators associated with the mosque. But at the same time, with that completely separate access, it gives the flexibility to have it as a wider provision within 
with a new home. That's that's good to know because I was a little worried that if it was some of the people that worked at the mosque, they might never have a any time off or any time off <laughs> because it's it's very hard if you live on the premises, you know, above the shop to actually get some time off. So that was my concern. So thank you for answering that so clearly. And as I said, thank you again for the the, the style and the uh, the um, the architectural integrity of the building that actually denotes its purpose as well as making it very much accessible to the public. Thank you. Thank you. I saw um, Councillor Singh Verdi next, and then I see James Beckles, and then you, Councillor Patel. Thank you. Um, I welcome the issues that's come through. And I have actually been to the mosque currently as it is. Yeah. Um, just a question, obviously not, uh, I would say, directly related to the planning expert. The current mosque has quite a unique film and the colour. You've moved away from that colour yeah. uh, in a sense that I understand it's we are moving a lot of times as well. Do you do you think the community feels or will feel that that aspect, which was quite unique uh, in the borough, and people have always said, which mosque is it? Yeah, the one down barking of the Green Dome. So do you think that is something which uh, you feel could be an impact, or do you think that the new dome and the colour which you you're using now will have a better impact? Uh, you know, if you're asking me personally, then I'd have to say, I know it's quirky. The minaret is very quirky, the existing minaret and dome. But I do feel that that building is, is set in a time warp. It's like it's not progressed in time in terms of the infrastructure. That building, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but, trustees, but my understanding is that it was back in 1982 that they took possession of the mosque. I mean, you can have been a major player as a service provider within the borough for over 40 years, well over 40 years, in fact. But to me, we felt that because of the strategic importance of the location as a Western gateway, rather than being quirky, we want something aspirational and very modern. And we make no object, no apology for having something that is quite, we, we feel, state of the art in terms of both the provision, but also in terms of being a very modern contemporary building. That's my opinion. I think that'd be, that's a good thing with some saying that, yes, we are moving forward with the times and the quirkiness which uh, people used to say that's the mosque there would be no longer there, which is important. Yeah. It's quite a unique place in its own way. Yeah, I think this, the site location is really important and we understand the, the objectives, strategic objectives of the council in really having something of quality there. Councillor Beckles. Thanks. Um, my first question is around the jobs. I can see that 35% will be um, go to local people. Yeah. And those 36 jobs <clears throat> go to local people. Can, can you tell us what level they will be? Will it be apprenticeships or uh, managers? What level they will yeah, be? Yeah, so we will obviously look at local uh, contractors. We know one or two. We've worked on a couple of other mosques in, in, in New Home, so we know local contractors. And obviously that would be the workforce. If there are apprentices, apprenticeship opportunities, obviously we would look at that. That's something that we'd have to look at with Patrick as well. It's not just something that we could look at by ourselves. We've also increased the employment level as because a lot big, uh, the building is a lot bigger. So the employment in terms of full-time goes up about threefold. Uh, so yeah, and also in terms of rather than getting materials and stuff, I mean, there's so many local builders merchants within Newham, and it's the thing that most builders will do. They won't go to their, a builders merchant that, that's kind of miles away. Local builders merchant, they'll get supplies from there. So obviously that makes sense as well. So there are opportunities and they will be fulfilled. If you're asking me to the full extent of apprenticeships, I've got to be honest, I can't answer that aspect of it yet, but all the other aspects, yes. Okay, so local contractors and Yeah, local workforce. If it's within your framework. Yeah. And um, another question I had is around dust management, especially around the demolition side. It's quite an old building. Yeah. I can see in it's page one of, of the seven that, that there's plans to have a um, management plan. Is that before or is that after if you grant permission? Yeah. And how robust will that be? Would that be about because it is an old building collecting all the dust the demolition, make sure that it's safe sure. as, as it's coming down? That will be part of the conditions. I mean, it's, it's already one of the conditions being proposed. But if I could just answer on those two points, you made a very good point. There are two aspects that 
that we normally find with demolition of, of buildings. One is obviously massive amounts of dust from the demolition. But if you do a soft strip first, meaning that you don't demolish the whole building, you keep the walls in place, the windows in place, that actually mitigates all the dust going everywhere. So there's internal soft strip first. And then in terms of dust management, spraying constantly. So the water is air, uh, spray airborne water droplets will settle that dust before it goes all over the, the environment. So that's also part of the strategy, by the way, within the air quality assessment and in you know, a proposal. So it's all there. It's been identified and it will be part of the um, construction logistics plan that is going to be, I believe, conditioned. So it, it's, it's, it's picked up here. Okay. And okay. my question, my last question, well, last of two questions. One is about the um, facade mock up. This is to officers. Um, can you explain 139.10 to us? Because, you know, reading it, the point I'm saying is the facade mock up, at what stage the applicants would have to produce that. And again, to officers about the traffic management plan. Barking Road is, gets very busy. Um, I, I imagine construction times is between 8 and 6 p.m. Those are often peak times as well, um, just to make sure we have a robust traffic management plan so that traffic can freely move up and down the street or, or <laughs> on that particular site, just so that we can manage transport, buses and everything else, not having a particular choke point at, um, I guess, the arc really of uh, Barking Road. Sorry, that was dropping in and out a little bit. I think um, the first question was relating to the facade mock-up mm -hmm. um, and how that will be secured by condition. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, if you can explain what one what the I guess your paragraph means um, for a lay for a lay person like myself, and also what does that include and involve? So sorry, that was one three nine. Did you say? Yeah, one three nine ten. What page is that on, James? 139. Oh, sorry, I was looking at paragraph. Yeah. Paragraph 139. It's page 139, paragraph 10. Um, just to explain briefly what the facade mock-up means. Yeah, so essentially the facade mock-up is um, sort of a section, effectively, of a building that is mocked up. So it will be sort of a brick or it's sort of in basic terms, sort of a brick panel with sort of a metal or cladding that might be kind of associated with that. So I think there's been quite a few examples where a facade mock-up has been um, sort of included. Um, Jane and James, I don't know if you want to say any have, more on that. I'm sorry, Sophie, we have quite a bad connection. I think the issues you're having hearing us, we're having as well. Um, James can you hear, or Jane? Can you, hear, can, you hear, can you hear me okay? Can you... We can, but you're very echoey. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Am I still echoey? Um, <laughs> should we have one final go? James, do you want to try and come you in might... see if we have better sound quality with you? Try me. D does this work any better? Yeah. It does seem to be, yes. Are you able okay. to assist us, James? Yeah, I'll, I'll get to it before it cuts out. Um, the facade mock-up is a, a physical replica of what that section will look like so that you can go to it, you can see it, feel it, experience what it will look like. And it gives a full impression of how the building uh, will be viewed. Um, in, in design, you can only get so much information sometimes uh, in 2D uh, from the plans, but the, the physical mock-up is intended to um, ensure that it all fits together seamlessly, um, both visually and, you know, from a construction format too. So, I mean, from our perspective, can we effectively be assured that it's an additional layer of assurance about design and materials quality? A absolutely, that, that's its very intention, is that not, you know, notwithstanding the approved documents and plans uh, in condition two, um, that level of detail will be provided under, under condition 10 now. Okay. I might have to put you on the spot, James, as, as you're the one with the most reliable sound. Um, Councillor Bethel's second question was about traffic management, particularly about this being on a very busy spot on a main road. I'm um, thinking about the, um, the traffic and particularly about buses going along there and how that will interact with construction. Um, I'm just looking for a uh, 
construction logistics plan. I say on condition four, there is a demolition and construction logistics plan, um, and the the applicant will submit that to us. It's on it's on page one three seven. Yep. And all of that information will be provided about how the practical constraints of construction uh, will be uh, will be managed um, to try and ensure deliveries and things like that are outside of peak peak times. That's great. Thank you. And I suppose we could just urge the applicant and officers to work together and to try to minimise disruption as far as is possible on such a busy road. Um, Councillor Patel, I saw you next. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's good to see so many people from the local community get together and uh, come and support this particular application. So thank you all for coming. And it's great to see so many of you here and uh, united in your, in your front uh, as well. So uh, thanks very much. Um, Chair, you covered the uh, the bins, uh, which I had uh, some concern about, and uh, Councillor Beckles also mentioned uh, jobs, which I was quite curious about. There's one other topic that I wanted uh, some clarity on, which was the biodiversity, if wearing my other hat, um, as Deputy Cabinet Member for Environment, I uh, wanted to just... Um, dig a little bit deeper into page 131 and 132, which men mentions fine diversity and greening. Um, it says uh, net gains, and I was just wondering what what that, what that those net gains may be. Could I perhaps refer that question to the applicants? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we feel, I'm sure we all agree here, that it's Barking Road, that section of Barking Road is very urban, very hard-edged urban environment. So what we've done is we've had to, uh, as part of the security measures, we've been asked because it's a you know you, you want to create a welcoming entrance, there's a nice glazed facade, but at the same time there's a security risk. Of, so we've been asked to provide some kind of crash security measures, in, impact uh, you know anti impact uh, measures. So it made sense that yes we could have bollards or we could have planters, solid plate uh, core steel, and make planters out of them. So they're doing two things. They're greening the entrance area because we have set the building slightly back from what it currently is. So we've created this little kind of uh, uh, security space in front. And within that, the idea is planters bolted into, uh, into the concrete slab on pads and heavyweight, in any case, um, court end steel, quite thick, and planters inside. So that's point one. Point two is that we have a green roof at the roof level. It doesn't go all the way across because we have to also provide PV and other measures to have, you know, sustainable energy generation. But uh, there is a quite a generous section of green roof at the top. So that's a sedum green roof. We'll be looking in terms of the detail specification of having plants and shrubs that are allow cross pollination between species and the species for cross pollination. That's obviously just having it as an attractive thing is not, you know, it needs to go more than that. So that's where we, we specifically mentioned that would make sure that it has a biodiversity role in terms of selection of flora. Uh, so yes. that was number two. Number three, we have amenity space for the flats. Normally you require about five square meters. I think one has 15, one has about 12, the other is just about five, is five. So it meets the minimum standards. So again, that is scope as part of the amenity and the enjoyment of the residential units to have that as amenity space and greening of that space as well. It's not greening for public realm, but it's greening for the people who can utilize that space as part of the flats. Through you, Chair, um, I also commend the um, the car-free facility um, and like to commend the flat, you know, and very much in support of the car-free facility and the cycle provision as well. Yeah, that's really good to see. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Sally Ponton. Um, I might have missed it. But I was wondering whether the new, I take it the new facility is going to give more um, space for the madrasa. Yeah. I often pass by that space on the way here, yeah. come to meetings. It's when all the kids are coming in and you can see them skipping in and the parents are very happy for them to go in. Yeah. So I was ho I take it from the plans that yes. we've seen that there's going to be more madrasa space. There is indeed. And I think that what we try to address, I mean, the plans in very simple terms, the existing plans are, Braille hall at ground floor, yeah. Braille hall at first floor. You have no dedicated space. So what tends to happen, and it's all in our DAS, and I'm, you've seen it, you've experienced it in other ways. There are curtains that subdivide that rear space. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to pray, 
you have a section that is curtained off and people are, are children are learning, uh, you know, the, the, there's teaching and learning going on. There's no sound separation. There's no fire separation and there's no safeguarding. You know, that's what I'm saying. The building is stuck in a time warp, warp from 1980s. You know, we can't have this kind of thing happening in the 21st century. So there are, there's a dedicated floor for classrooms, interactive whiteboards, all of that. It's all part of the proposal. And it's safeguarding is a fundamental part of it as well. We don't want the public mixing with the kids. So that's all been taken up care of as part of the design proposal. Thank you very much for that. In my other role, I'm the cabinet member for education. That's okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a final um, comment before I move us to the vote, um, which, you know, as my colleagues have said, there's, you know, a lot to welcome here and a lot of a lot of work that I know you'll be doing going forwards with our officers as well. Um, I found it, it's it's so great to see community facilities coming forward for permission. And I particularly welcome the provision of the hall that can be rented by anyone, which I, I really hope will help to open up the building, not only to your own community, but also other people as well. Um, and as well as making it available for rent, um, I know there have been several really lovely kind of come and visit your local mosque um, initiatives within Newham, which I've gone to with my family. And I think, uh, you know, even when this is built, I just really like to encourage you um, to open up in that way, particularly given, as you say, all this very interesting and very modern architecture going on. It could be a really lovely thing to invite people in for them to come and experience it as well and to see the work that's going on there too. Can I comment? Uh, as, an, as a trustee of you, Kim, uh, we have two mosques uh, on the same road, Barking Road. We have Masjid Ibrahim and Masjid Bilal. Masjid Ibrahim was built in uh, early 2000. And whatever we are now looking for, Masjid Bilal, it's already there. So we have, uh, during COVID, you may have heard about, we have uh, arranged uh, the surgeries. We had the vaccination center. We had, uh, you name it, we have a, one of the biggest food bank running in, in Masjid Ibrahim. We have been uh, using that facility to accommodate our local uh, community. And local community means not Muslim community, but everyone. So same thing we want to replicate in Masjid Bilal as well, that all these facilities which have been using, inshallah, we will use it in Masjid Bilal. So it's open for everyone. That's good to hear, thank you. Um, committee members, I'm going to move us to the vote. Sophie, could I ask you to share the officer recommendation, please? Hopefully that should be coming through. I don't think it is. Yes, we can see it now. Um, so we're asked to note the contents of the report and the update and resolve to agree the reasons for approval as set out and grant planning commission, etc. Um, can I ask those in favour to please show their hands? And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to the other items on our agenda. I always say this is a public meeting. You're very welcome to stay. But equally, if you would like to get home to your families and homes, um, then I would be I'd be very understanding of that. And I, yeah, thank, you time thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Um, for those joining us online, we do have a relatively large number of people in the public gallery. I'm just going to pause just for a minute or two to allow the room to clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you, very good. Thank you, guys, for all the work that you've done. You've collected all the money. You've built the correct infant Allah. Thank you, thank you. Allah. Very welcome. Thank you. Take care. I've never been into so many hatches. Yeah. I just came from Hatches. Yeah. Take care. Oh, I have a bit late. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everything that you do for the community. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. And it's good to see you. Thank you. Right, we've just about cleared the room, and so we will move on to item number six, which is London City Airport. <clears throat> um, remind me, did you want to be here just to answer questions, or oh no, you were here for the next one, weren't you? 
Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm getting confused. Um, have we been joined by Steve and Alan online? I think perhaps we have not. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, Cher. Can oh, you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Um, would you like to present to the committee or would you prefer to be available to answer any questions? Um, I'm, I'm happy to do both. Um, and if you wish, I won't speak for, for long, but shall I go ahead right now? Yep, that's absolutely fine. As, as before, I will set a timer and I'll let you know when you have just two minutes left. There's five minutes maximum, but that is a, a maximum, not a goal. Thank you, Chair. Um, as I said, I won't speak for long, uh, given the uh, officer recommendation and the, the good quality report you also have in front of you there. But the only thing I really wanted to um, really highlight was the fact that uh, what we have here is, in effect, a, a renewal of a, a previous scheme that would be well underway uh, were it not for the uh, COVID pandemic that had delayed the wider development program. But um, what we do have in this kind of renewal application is a um, uh, it's allowed us working with your officers to really realize a lot of benefits that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to deliver with the uh, previous scheme. Um, so to take, for example, the this application, it, it uh, uplifts a lot of the policy uh, requirements here, particularly around environment and sustainability. Um, we've had to update our scheme to meet the latest fire regulations as well, which is um, obviously uh, a, a good thing in terms of safety, but has uh, altered the parameters only slightly. Um, we've also um, worked with your design officers to help shape and design and, and refine the design code that will lead the reserve matters applications at a, at a later date. And we've also been able to involve NATS at a very early stage of, of the um, development of the parameters. And that's particularly important for the digital control tower, which wasn't actually built uh, when the previous application went through and consented. So the, there's a lot of factors that this application brings in and improves upon the previous um, uh, consent that was issued for the site. So um, all I can say is um, you can feel confident in going with the uh, officer recommendation of approval here. Um, thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, so with that, can we please move to the officer report? Um, Liam, do you want to see how your sound is working? Yeah. Is sound check? Am I coming through okay? Yeah, yeah, that seems promising. Okay. Um, proceed. We'll let you know if there are any issues. Okay. okay, hopefully you should start to see presentation. Yep, we can see that now. Great. Okay, so this is item six. This is London City Airport. Um, I don't think the airport needs much of an introduction in terms of where it is on in the borough, but the site we're specifically looking at here is the area outlined in red. So it's part of what is currently the car park and the digital control tower. So the kind of gray uh, rectangle in the top right of the red box, that's the digital control tower. And I've just sort of mocked up a uh, satellite photo from Google Images just to give you a bit more context on where we're actually looking at for this application. So this application is an outline application with a reserve matters of layout, scale, appearance, landscaping, and access for a hotel use with their ancillary bar and restaurant uses. It have a maximum footprint of a 48 by 48 meters and a height of 29 meters on the north side, but stepping up to 35 in the south. It would result in an estimated amount of 14,680 square meters of hotel floor space and that would equate to approximately 280 rooms. So just to clarify for those members of the public and members of the committee who might not be familiar with outline applications, um, as they suggest, outline applications deal with the principle of de development and the sort of maximum sizes of what building could go there. But the detail of the layout, the scale and the appearance is sort of highlighted there. That's dealt with at the reserve matter stage. So. A subsequent application will come forward uh, to, to look at the application in detail um, and that would likely go before committee as well for final approval. So a brief planning background, um, the, the airport has permission for the City Airport Development Programme, otherwise known as CADAP. Uh, that was approved back in 2013, I believe, um, on appeal. As part of that application, there was also the outline permission for the hotel, which was known as CADAP 2. That was actually approved in July as part of the committee. Um, we've also, members are probably quite aware of the application last year, which refused in August for the 
uh, alteration to the curfew hours. So the reason I bring that up is just for clarity, this application is only for the outline hotels, so only the element which is in that red line uh, is completely independent of the other permissions mentioned. So any decision on this won't influence the other uh, application which is currently under appeal. So it shouldn't have any bearing in your uh, final decision. In terms of consultation, 138 neighbours were consulted, site notices and newspaper adverts published, no objections were received. The GLA were um, reviewed the application and they support the proposal. So the key planning considerations here are the principle of development, employment impacts, design impacts, impact on amenity, landscape and biodiversity, and any transport impacts. So beginning first with the principle of development, as Stephen mentioned, there was outline permission for this um, as part of CADAP 2. As part of outline permissions, there is a separate time limit to begin the reserve matters as well as the normal sort of three-year rule that we have. Um, that's due to expire, I believe, in October this year. So at the moment, it's still a material consideration. Um, the provision of a hotel in this location was established as acceptable under that previous application, and it remains so. Uh, a hotel next to an airport is not a particularly controversial choice. Um, but land is not allocated for any other commercial or residential use, so a hotel here wouldn't prevent any other uh, objective of the council to come forward. So the principal development is considered acceptable. In terms of employment, it's the hotel use that would generate some employment. Uh, the submission indicates that there'll be 100 jobs secured during construction and 130 direct jobs in the end user phase. As part of the heads of terms, there is a, a financial contribution of £205,000 towards employment, and therefore the impacts on employment are considered to be acceptable. In terms of design, uh, as mentioned, so this is outline app application only, so the final design will be determined at reserve matter stage and a parameter plan has been submitted. So you can think of a parameter plan as a box essentially showing the, the maximum size of the walls and the height and everything of the building and that's been assessed and is considered acceptable. As part of the submission, there is also a design code. So this is a document which sets out mandatory and advisory elements to ensure that the design is consistent with the wider CADAP scheme as that comes forward, but also so that it's acceptable in terms of our own design uh, objectives and policies. So our design officers have reviewed that. And as Steve mentioned, we did work and there was a, a few changes made to it and it's now considered acceptable. In terms of impact on the amenity of neighbors, the location and the height of the hotel puts it away from the nearest residential units, which would be blocked by the DLR, DLR line and the road to the south. Noise and air quality impacts, as you can imagine, it's unlikely that the hotel is going to create any worse impact than the airport immediately next to it. So we consider that to be acceptable. And this is just an indication of the kind of thing that could come forward. So this is just, uh, as I say, indicative. Um, the final design will be approved, but this is just to give you an idea of the kind of scale and size of the building. And I'll just follow that with a kind of artist rendition. You can kind of see, uh, so at the moment, most of this is car park, but this is uh, a rendition of what it would look like when the CADAP scheme starts to come forward and how it would fit into that in sort of broader context. In terms of landscaping and biodiversity, we recognize that there is limited opportunity for landscaping on this site, just due to the location of where it is. Um, the UGF, the urban greening factor is 0.21, which is below the 0.3 we normally require. However, one of the limitations of uh, development so close to the airport is that you cannot do as much um, green roof because there is a requirement to avoid bird habitats, nesting, that kind of thing on roofs due to the uh, safety concerns and how that affects the airport. Having said that, we are fairly confident that the UGF score of 0.21 could be improved during the reserve matter stage. So on balance, we consider it to be acceptable. Um, the proposal indicates that there will be a biodiversity net gain of 11%, which again is greater than 10% required. And so that is also acceptable. In terms of transport, the proposal will be car-free development other than disabled car parking. The wider CADAP scheme, as it comes forward, would also manage the parking of the hotel. The CADAP scheme, as you recall, was submitted at the same time as the previous outline hotel permission, so it would have been factored into the design of that scheme. Cycle parking would be secured by condition and in the reserve matter stage. One point of note, TFL did comment on the application requesting contribution towards a cycle hire docking station and a commitment to safeguard land. Um, LBN officers did review this request. However, 
we view that as unduly onerous for a hotel use. As mentioned right at the start, this application has to be viewed just in the context of the hotel only. And we think that the higher station is better addressed as part of the wider CADEP scheme. Um, as part of a condition, though, we do require a, a funding and implementation, implementation study to be undertaken by the airport. Um, and they have agreed to that. There is the intent by the airport to provide some form of cycle uh, hire, but we just feel that as part of this application is not the correct approach. So to summarize, the principal development has been already established and is supported in this location. It would provide employment benefits in accordance with policy. The design impacts will be managed by the design code and the immediate impacts are considered acceptable. No concerns are raised by officers regarding transport or environmental impacts subject to conditions. And the reserve matters would be submitted at a later stage for further scrutiny and final approval. Therefore, the recommendation is for the committee to agree the reasons for approval set out in the committee report, to delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development to grant permission subject to the completion of a legal agreement in the Section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act, based on the heads of terms identified in Appendix 2 and the conditions listed in Appendix 1 of the committee report. Thank you, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, Adeline, and Dee first, and then James. Thank you. Um, thank you ever so much for bringing forward a um, uh, a development that's going to be taking account of the high contamination that may be at that site. So thanks for including the um, the conditions for that within the uh, the approval of the application. I do note, however, that while it's really great that there's going to be sixteen construction jobs um, available whilst the work is being undertaken and that there's the proposed 130 jobs at the end of the construction, that therefore there is probably a need for those cycle recycling spots that TFL have proportioned. Whilst this will be most of the time a hotel, it will be a place of work for those 130 people. And I take it that in the locality at the moment, because most of the buildings are older, they don't have the capacity for that already. Um, are you able to give any comments on, um, I think you are, are you talking about cycle parking facilities for so people while they're working? It's um, cycle recharging that the TFL noted, but that Liam said um, the officers didn't feel needed to be strictly adhered to what TFL had recommended because they felt it was a place of uh, temporary stay um, because it was a hotel. But as I've pointed out in their own page 186.61, uh, it states that there will be a hundred and up to 130 jobs. So I know that not everyone will be there at the same time, but we are will be encouraging those workers to come to work, whether it's by manual pedal or electric pedal. Yeah. Yep, so a couple of points, just to clarify, the cycle docking station is uh, its not sort of charging electric bikes, it would be like the Santander bikes, um, one of those kind of docking stations, what they would like to see there. The other point to make as well is, although they are separate applications, I've made the point, it is in the context of London City Airport, so uh, this isn't a case where we have separate landowners, so the airport is currently undergoing that um, process of changing, and as part of CADAP, there is a large number of cycle parking spaces to come forward as well. So uh, ideally that will come forward at the same time. Um, perhaps the applicant has a little bit more information on the kind of cycle provision they have at the moment, but our transport officers were content that the overflow, if you like, can be managed with what's there on site. And also just to recognize as well that the DLR connection is obviously very good here. So, Can I bring the applicant on that point? Um, are you able to reassure us at all in terms of current cycle parking provision and anything additional that you might do, particularly during construction? Yes, um, happy to, Chair. Um, ju just to say, as, as Liam has touched upon, the um, the wider, uh, well, we have, there's, there's three things really to touch upon. There's first of all, what we're doing currently in terms of cycle parking provision. And at the moment, we're bringing forward a scheme of um, particularly staff-oriented, uh, secure cycle parking with electric charging um, throughout our campus, starting at our head office. Um, second of all, um, with the travel plan re requirements to investigate um, cycle hire provision across the 
the airport, which we've been engaging both with Newham and TfL uh, on. And and this, I think, is is where um, we we didn't necessarily disagree with TfL. It's just we <laughs> were coming at it from different angles, really. Um, we we're we're not. Um, in a position to say that cycle hire of some description won't work on site. In fact, it's something we're actively investigating right now. It was just, it was felt safeguarding land specifically on the um, constrained hotel site. Uh, we felt constrained us too much. And that and that's part of the reason why we were more than happy to agree to a, um, a feasibility study where we could, we could take that away and have a real look at it properly and see how that will fit in with the rest of our uh, cycle strategy across our campus but what we were reluctant to do is say yes it must go on this one hotel site um the, the other thing i will add is that there is cycle parking provision with the hotel scheme which has been conditioned as well and that's although it's not cycle hire it is secure cycle storage for any employee who who, who is working there as well so hopefully that covers your your question there and would you envisage um, there being cycle parking available for um, workers during the construction phase as well? Um, yes, I mean we we can. Uh, that would be something that we could we could provide. As as I say, there is cycle provision across the, the campus, and we we're always looking for um, sustainable modes of transport for all of our workers, whether they be operational, construction, or or, or any or anything else, Kanish. Thank you. Did you have any further questions? No, that's that, thank you. That's great. Thank you, James. I saw you next, um, and then Mirage, and then Alan. I see you. I'm just looking at the um, the GLA letter from page two two five and two two seven, and it does link to um, the biodiversity net gain increase, and it's good that there is a increase, although you know I think you know ten percent is fairly on the lower side. But I think there's an opportunity here to kind of open up that landscape. It is quite a harsh surrounding. You've got DLR, um, you've got DLR platform coming through, it takes a while further down in Silvertown. You've got the airport, local residents facing um, the, the airport. Um, there's not much greenery. I think, you know, I'm sure you can really bolster 11.7 or at least get more out of it. Yeah. And I, I just wondered the um, ecological management plan. Um, Will that be produced after, also once you're, if you're given plan permission and once you submit your more detailed plans and reserve matters, will that um, ecological plan be more robust and tell us about the trees, the landscaping, actually really opening up that area so that it's both welcoming, not just for business travel, but also for the local community, or providing maybe cosmetically, I guess, an ecological benefit to the area? Sorry, was that directed at me or the case officer? Um, I guess both. I think from, from, from you as the applicant, as to assure us about the um, EMP plan and yep. also from officers about how um, we can I guess, get more out of that 11.7% um, as stated in the uh, letter. So Stephen, should we go to you first? That's fine, happy to. Um, look, in the first instance, um, it is a an outline application. So the figures we've um, we provided to the GLA and we've been discussing with Newham are based on the, the best information we have to hand. But as soon as we have more detailed design work up, particularly around things like how much um, you know, landscape we can do around the site, what, what can we do in terms of green roof compared with solar panel provision on the roof, then we'll have a really good understanding of how much we can enhance all that um, kind of ecological uh, benefit to the site. Um, keeping in mind, we do have um, aviation safety uh, issues. We do have to consider about um, attracting wildlife, particularly birds to the airport. So where we do provide landscape and we have to be conscious of things, for example, not to provide trees that have berries on them or, or um, blossoms that attract lots of large insects that might attract other birds, those type of things. Um, the the second the second point really is to look at the the hotel in the context of the wider catap development, and the um, the hotel will effectively sit on the eastern end of the um, of of the new forecourt that will sit to the front of the new terminal building. Now you're you're absolutely right. It is a very at the moment a very harsh um, hard um, 
landscaped area that you see here. But in, in future, those uh, forecourt proposals will bring forward a much uh, greener space, a much more sustainable drainage and a much higher uh, ecological uh, value to, to the site, like I said, as far as we can do. So it will it will sit within a much, I guess, um, more, more pleasant environment that, than it does at the moment being a kind of like a, a, a swathe of, of hard um, car parking. Thank you. Liam, did you want to make any further comments? I think Stephen's covered the most of it, but I'll just say that it's quite normal for an outline permission to not be incredibly detailed on elements like that. The purpose of that condition, that report will be much more detailed. Um, and, you know, let's say it came in and it only achieved 10% because with that condition, we'd have the ability then as planners to push back and say, we want at least a minimum of what was sort of promised before. So that's there to sort of reassure that, I'd say. Thank you. Um, Mirage. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to reiterate that, that particular point um, that was just made, because I thought it was really important. When you look at the actual figures and then convert them into percentages, you're looking at about 33 to 34% below the required um, number there. And I, I slightly fear, and I'll say this in the nicest way possible, is being um, armed off or slash brushed under the carpet type of response. There is, there, and there are ways of greening and increasing biodiversity uh, in line with uh, being conscious about birds and aviation. Um, you know, those that travel will know when you land near or, you know, at the airport and you see greenery and there's lots of it across the world, it's, a, it's proven that it can be done. So, Rather than make excuses about it, let's you know let, let's achieve it and go beyond it, rather than fall be, you know fall far behind and then make excuses around uh, around birds and aviation legislation etc. Doesn't that doesn't require response by the way? It's just a it's just a comment and I I, I do say it in the in the most polite way possible. Um, the 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 next point it sounds like I'm uh, on a on a winch marathon, but I'm not. Is a uh, <laughs> is a consultation, and it's my final point. I am slightly perplexed and disappointed that so many residents have been written to, but there hasn't been a hasn't been any responses in support or uh, you know sort of against the particular plans of you know as there as how did we write to them? How did we communicate with them? Did we door to door knock? Uh, was it a letter in the post, etc.? Liam, That's could, a you, question. Liam yeah. could you just walk us through the um, consultation process? Yeah, absolutely. So we have as part of our process a statement of community involvement, which sets out what to what extent uh, we notify our neighbours around any, any planning application. There's a sort of buffer zone. Um, so that would go out in the form of a letter when the application was initially received. Um, and then applicants have, uh, sorry, neighbours have up until today, really, to lodge any objections they have. We also put adverts in the local papers and we put up site notices physically on site and around the area where we think they're likely to be seen. And that's uh, that's quite in line with standard planning process. There is no uh, door knocking, as you say, because it's really to invite um, comments rather than to seek them, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just comment on that? Is yeah, it of course. something that we need to take away and think about how we do the consultations? Perhaps that, perhaps that is something we could come back to more broadly at one of our development control forums. I'm, I'm aware as well that there's the legal consultation, which we are required to do as a council, which obviously we pay for. But then there's also the opportunity for developers to do their own consultation and to show how they've gone above and beyond and, and liaised. And that's, you know, that, that, that's a whole, a whole other issue which goes far beyond this application. Um, but perhaps we could um, perhaps we could make a note of that and come back to the issue of consultation in one of our Friday morning um, meetings. If, if I'm if I'm echoey, sorry, but we we go beyond um, the statutory minimum. So um, the minimum that you'd have to do is just put up a site notice. So there's been quite a lot of research into what's the best way to um, engage with people on planning applications. And that's shown that it is by individual letter. So um, I think there's an issue about 
um, cost um, and also consistency. So, you know, we are in a constrained environment, so I don't think we could go around and do door knocking. And then in the statement of community involvement, as you say, Councillor Tripp, there is an onus on the developer, um, particularly for these bigger applications, to do their own um, pre-application consultation. Um, perhaps what would be useful as a first step, um, Jane, would be if you could send the um, statement of community involvement to me and then I can circulate it to committee members and we can just get ourselves familiar with that as part of increasing our understanding. Um, I, I did just have... Great, thank you. I did just have a couple of quick questions. Um, one of them was that obviously this is a car free development apart from the provision of blue badge disabled parking. Um, and I wanted to know, obviously this is just the outline application, but from what we have thus far, do you feel that the blue badge parking can probably be accommodated within the red line and we won't be looking um, to sort of take over um, road space or highway space for that? Is that to me, Councillor? Yes, it is, sorry. It, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so our transport team have looked at that, and one thing to bear in mind is at the moment the the site is a car park. So in the sort of meantime, it, there is parking available, uh, blue badge parking for staff. As the development progresses, naturally a lot of those parking spaces will go away, um, and then I, I suppose at some stage the uh, the hotel will sit within a wider scheme, which accounts for both staff and. Um, visitor parking so it doesn't necessarily have to be within the red line as long as we're confident it won't be affecting the public mm -hmm. um so you'll notice as well in the heads of terms there's restrictions on parking permits for staff stuff like that so yeah. they can't park in the local uh residential base great thank you and my only other question is really about the design obviously you've helpfully um, emphasised to us that the images that we've got are really just a sort of an indication of the overall maximum um, massing. Um, I saw in the papers that there has been a design code submitted, um, and when the I assume when the more detailed application comes back at that stage, you're suggesting perhaps a DRP chairs review. Um, at that point, would that normally come to committee, and we would at that point get some more assurance on design, or is that done at an officer level at that stage? So for this type of application, the reserve matters would come to committee based on the okay. base. Yeah. So a DRP, we did consider whether it was worth doing one, but for a design code, it's not completely useful because it is just aspirations. Um, uh, the, use, the useful part of a design code is any application which comes forward needs to adhere to that approved design code. So yeah. it's a way of controlling the general flow of it, if you like. And you and um, design officers are assured that the design code, as it is at the moment, is doing what it should be in terms of um, being ambitious for a building that is well designed. Correct. Yeah. So design code sets up things like um, active frontage type of materials um, and things like that. So it's to kind of give a steer to any developer, even if it's not the airport, if it's a future hotel operator who takes up the case. Uh, is to make sure that it stays consistent with what we envisage for that area and what the airport does as well. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to suggest that we move to the vote. Um, are you able to share your recommendation again, please, Liam? Yes. Thank you. The recommendation from officers is that we agree the reasons for approval as set out in the report, etc. Um, can I ask those in favour to please give a show of hands? Thank you. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. We will move on, therefore, to item seven, which is the multi car park in Stratford Centre. Um, <laughs> apologies for my confusion earlier. Did you say that you were here to answer questions? questions rather than to present. I am. I mean, I, I spoke in front of the committee when it was originally approved in mm -hmm. 2014, and I did the same in 2019 when it was re-approved. Um, and given the officer's recommendation for approval, I'm very happy to answer questions, um, but you probably don't want to hear from me again. Right. Well, thank you very much. In which case, we'll move to the officer. Thank you. Okay, can I check that you're able to see that? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so this is item seven, the multi-story car park at Stratford Centre, otherwise known as Roof East. So this location, it's the car park serving the Stratford Centre, just opposite Stratford Station and Westfield. So a bit of planning background, uh, as mentioned just, just a minute ago, application was approved in May 2014 for a temporary meanwhile use to change the 
level seven and eight of the car park into a uh, urban park, which has a cafe, bar, toilets, and a number of multi-use spaces. And um, that was a temporary consent. So that had a time limit on it. It was then approved again in June, 2019 for another temporary permission to extend this further. Um, and that was also approved with another time limit on it. So this application is quite simply a continuation of this use, uh, but we're on a permanent basis rather than as a temporary permission. And I'll explain why in a second. So this is just to give some context. This is a bird's eye view of the roof space. So as mentioned, it has a number of uh, uses on it. It's the a bar and a cinema and things like that. And I found some stock images of people enjoying what looks like what summer used to look like anyway. Um, <laughs> in, in terms of consultation, uh, 318 neighboring properties were consulted. Site notices erected out around the site and a newspaper advert was published as well. Three letters of support were received. So just to give context to the letters of support, they did specifically mention that the uh, the noise impacts of the site were well managed and they had no sort of uh, concerns about light or disturbance or noise uh, resulting from the proposal. So the key planning considerations are the principle of development, impact on employment, design, impact on amenity and transport. So beginning first with the principle of development, um, as mentioned, previous applications were subject to a temporary permission. So initially when this application was submitted, it was for another uh, temporary permission. Um, part of planning practice, practice guidance advises against repeated temporary consents. Um, ideally in planning, if something is temporary for you know, more than two times, it really should just be permanent. Um, so we did advise the applicant that in this case, it makes sense to apply just for permanent permission. Um, the reason for the temporary consent originally is this whole area is due for a regeneration. And the idea of temporary consent is one, to provide a meanwhile use as the area redevelops, but also to prevent um, prejudicing, prejudicing any future development in that area. However, in this case, the use is actually leased from the council uh, until 2027 at the moment. So the council ultimately has the final say on the continuation of the use, even if permission is permanent. Um, as such, there's no sort of danger of prejudicing the regeneration of the area. And lastly, it contributes towards the nighttime economy of the area. So the principle of development is considered acceptable. In terms of employment impacts, um, it currently employs 20 part-time equivalent jobs and five full-time jobs. And quite simply, that would continue by approving this permission. In terms of design, the, uh, the structures on the roof, they're not very visible from the ground level. Uh, so they're only really visible from the taller buildings nearby, which would have gone up probably after this was uh, put in place. We had no complaints about the design or the appearance. So there was no concerns on that. In terms of immunity impacts, so I touched on earlier, so there are conditions which uh, limit the hours of use on Monday to Sunday and on Sunday. Uh, sorry, I should say Monday to Saturday and then Sunday separately. Uh, there's also conditions that limit the noise levels and the type of use on there. So there are no sort of concerts or things like that which would occur on this site. Um, as mentioned, let's support state that sound levels have been restricted and there's been no complaints that I'm aware of to our environmental health colleagues. And the LBN licensing team have also confirmed that they have limited the noise making equipment and they're content with how that's worked. So there are no concerns in terms of immediate impacts. In terms of transport, it does take up around 125 parking spaces from the car park. However, the site is obviously very well connected to Stratford Station and current policy seeks to reduce car reliance. There's still 442 parking spaces remaining. Um, at the time of the first permission, it was actually identified that that car park was very underutilized. Um, we haven't had any updated information on that, but I would imagine that would be the case now. There's no policy really protecting these parking spaces, as you can understand, the push towards more sustainable transport. So there are no objections here in terms of transport. So very, uh, very simply, the summary, the development supports the nighttime economy of the local area. Immunity impacts have been effectively managed by conditions and there are no concerns raised and the transport impacts are minimal. So the application is recommended for approval. So the recommendation there is to agree the reasons for approval set out in the committee report and delegate authority the Director of Planning and Development to grant permission subject to conditions. It's in the appendix one of the report. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Members, Mirage. Um, contrary to my comments on the previous item, um, I've been a visitor and my experience has been very good. 
Uh, so I, I welcome this. Um, subjective, of course, but my experience was. So I'm glad to see it continuing and glad to see it doing well. Um, just one point that I wanted to raise on page 234, it says the ward is Stratford and Newtown, which does not exist anymore. <laughs> so uh, just a typo. Perhaps just a note to officers to make sure we're reflecting new, new ward boundaries. Um, I wanted to follow up in a, in a similar vein to say that obviously um, you were expressing before concerns about, we were expressing before concerns about consultation responses. And I think there are some cases where actually a lack of responses kind of speaks volumes, but it's quite, and it's quite impressive to me that there are no concerns from either environmental health or from licensing or from local residents. And in fact, I did drop Stratford Council as a line as well, just to double check we weren't missing anything. And similarly, they had no concerns. And, and to me, a lack of information there actually shows that there's something, suggests that there's something really positive going on with a really well-managed venue, particularly one which is, you know, often sort of, you know, late night drinking, the kind of thing where we do see a lot of disturbance and that obviously just isn't happening here. So in this, I think in this case, the lack of responses is actually really encouraging. Definitely. Great. Hi, Linda. A couple of comments really in the sense that uh, could the facility, which I've been to once as well, um, the schools could hold events up there? We do, in fact. Um, we we have had schools holding events before. Um, we've also had the UEL holding events where there are students. Um, we tend to try and do those things. The, the main season... As you can imagine, with an open air rooftop venue, the, the season where you can make hay is quite short. Um, so we have had quite a lot of, of schools and colleges using the space outside of what I call the core summer months. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's something we encourage. We, we've tried, we set Refuse up in 2014 with London Borough of Newham. It was very much a partnership. Um, and over the years, that's changed a little bit in that I think that the regeneration team gradually became quite happy with how things ran and took a step back from it. Um, but we've continued to try and run the place in with that attitude in mind. So we have, a, a, for instance, a rooftop cinema, and we insist that every month they put on a local community screening, which we still work with Newham to run. It's completely free. The games operator, I think you saw images, we have things like crazy golf up on the roof. Um, and we insist that the operators put on family tickets on the weekends. Um, we absolutely encourage schools. One of the problems is that we're mainly open in the summer. And they're all on holiday at that point, a lot of the time. But we, we've always been open with the local community to try and work with them in any way we can. To kind of just ask for one other thing. Um, roof garden. You should come up. It's the only rooftop I've ever seen which has bees and butterflies on. It's wonderful. Um, we've got over 105 large planters now. We spend thousands on planting every year. We have gardeners up there who work up there. Um, I think it's the greenest car park I've ever seen. <laughs> How do we celebrate that? Because obviously that's not in here. But do we go out of our way to say, this is what we're actually doing? to make sure that people understand what's going on up there? We certainly, we we used to talk about it an awful lot more, particularly when we were much more working hand in glove with the Regen team. Um, we try and keep the word out there. We, you know, social media nowadays is a bit beyond me, but it's that seems to be the way that we put our message across. And we, we try and get that out there all the time. Our website has lots of images of the greening. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm always happy to talk about the place. I talk about it endlessly. So would you welcome schools to come along? Absolutely. Uh, see community groups to come along and to see what we're actually doing. Absolutely. Well, welcome back. Thank you. Jim. Very happy. Thank you. James. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, it's really good to see that you're making a use of um, an ex-car park. And I'm sure you can go to other parts of the country and see car ex-car parks, which are just derelicts to become slightly antisocial and eyesores. And I'm sure you're tapped into uh, Stratford Original, is it, mm -hmm. um, locally? And just emphasising what other colleagues mentioned about having that more wider. I know the time frame is very small and it seems to be getting shorter and shorter in the lack of a summer. 
lately. But um, yeah, if you can do more to kind of reach out to, I guess, our cultural assets as well in such a Stratford theatre, um, and possibly Westfield as well. Although I want to keep probably more in old Stratford and and, and emphasise more what we what we have on this side of, um, I guess, the the bridge. But if there's more that you can do, to go out there, reach out to the local community, and the students who are in the area who might be a long way from home, but actually have a place where they can find entertainment, find more community events, and also feel slightly more like there is a community within the area. And I think Stratford Centre is probably a great focal point for that. Originally, um, originally it was absolutely the intention and the point of Roof East was to try and bring, bring people back from the Westfield side to the cultural quarter. Um, and so it's especially in the early days we worked theatre, um, we work with them all, the, the whole of the cultural quarter. They put on events, they did walking theatres and performances up on the roof. Um, I'd like to work with them more. Yeah. It, it's, uh, we're very keen to it. And we get, last year we had 120,000 visitors coming oh. um, across, and that's between April and September. Um, and I like to think that they don't just come to Roof East, but they're also coming what I call the right side of the tracks. <laughs> and, so, and, and I guess it's just more like data of foot for do you do you know how many um people or where they live who come to visit you as they buy tickets? I'm sure you might be collecting postcodes. Do you know the footfall and where these people do? Live? It's it's the concentration is in the the neighboring boroughs as okay. you expect, but it's pan London. Um one other thing I would mention um I don't know why this has said it, but we said that we've got 20, um, 20 jobs. We actually, in June, we were employing 44 uh, young 18 to 25 year olds, 50% of whom are from the borough. Um, and a number of the others are just outside the borough. I was trying to encourage them in <laughs> before we fell apart. But so we, we're actually employing 44 young people up there who, who are having a great time. Um, uh, you know, and long may it continue. Thank you. Um, in which case, I'm going to suggest that we move to the vote. If we could have the recommendation on screen, please. Yep. Thank you. The recommendation from officers is that we agree the reasons for approval as set out, etc. Can I ask those in favour, please, for a show of hands? And that is once again unanimous. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, that concludes the business tonight. Um, the date of our next meeting is the sep September 2024. Um, although I'm sure I should be seeing all of you <laughs> lots before then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Seventeenth of September.